We looked at different types of bias and random error and intention to treat and per protocol analysis. We evaluated internal validity of superiority clinical trials and we interpreted clinical surrogate endpoints used in superiority clinical trials. Now, given a superiority clinical trial, evaluate its external validity. Once we interpret the results of randomized clinical trials, we need to clinically appraise the results before we can decide if the results actually apply to our patients. Of course, the first question we ask is, were the results statistically significant? And for this, we often look at the confidence interval along with the p-value. And if the p-value is less than alpha, and in clinical trials, we typically set alpha at 5%, we conclude that the results are statistically significant. And the reason we typically set alpha at 5% is that we don't want more than 5% chance of having a type 1 error. So we minimize the risk of having a type 1 error. Now, if the p-value is greater than alpha, the results are not statistically significant, which uh, could actually be to, due to a false negative or a type 2 error. Now, in order to evaluate type 2 error, we need to know the power of the study. So anytime the results are not statistically significant, you should always look at the power to see if the study was actually power to find a difference before you conclude that there is no difference between the group. When it comes to power, we look at beta. And beta is typically set between 10 to 20%, um, usually. Uh, you know, it could be a different number, but uh, usually we are good with about uh, 10 to 20%, which will result in a power of 80 to 90%. So we use this equation, power equals 1 minus beta. And the reason we are interested in power is that we use power to actually calculate sample size. So in order, so for example, in order to have an 80% power, we can actually calculate to see how many patients are needed in the study in order to have that power. Or sometimes instead of number of patients, they look at the number of events. So how many events, for example, how many number of mortalities need to happen in the study in order to be able to find the difference between the two studies. So when you look at those uh, calculations in the study, but the study, so let's say the study says we need to have uh, 2,000 patients in the study to have 80% power, but they only included 1,000 patients, that means that study was underpowered. So if, there's a, if the results are not statistically significant and the study was underpowered, you can conclude that this is due to a false negative. So they need to follow up with other studies with larger sample size. Now, sometimes when the results are statistically significant, it could be uh, due to overpower. So sometimes if you have too many patients or too many events, it, you can actually find a statistically significant difference between the two groups, but it might actually be smaller than the smallest effect of clinical interest. For example, let's say that you conduct a study to compare two drugs and you're interested to find a reduction of risk of mortality of at least 10%. Now, if you do find the results to be statistically significant, but the drug only reduced mortality by 2%, that really didn't reach the minimum 10% that, uh, that was of interest. That could often be due to over being overpowered. The next questions to consider are how large was the treatment effect? So when you look at the size of the treatment effect, you can look at things like absolute risk uh, reduction or relative risk reduction. Um, and you can also calculate number needed to treat or number needed to hard. Next, you should look at how precise was the estimate of the treatment effect. This is where you should uh, pay very close attention to the confidence interval. So the size of the confidence interval will tell you how precise uh, was the results of the study. So the results of the study are referred to as a point estimate. And the confidence interval is important to know if you were to uh, repeat the study, how likely is it to have something close to the point estimate. So for example, let's look at two studies. Studies A, which is shown in orange, and study B, uh, which is uh, shown in green. So although both of them have the same point estimate, both, uh, both studies showed a relative risk reduction of 25%. But when you look at the confidence interval, you can see that uh, study A had a very wide confidence interval, whereas study B had a narrow confidence interval. So we can say that study A is less precise compared to study B, or study B is more precise because the confidence interval is, uh, is narrower. 
It's also important to consider the confidence interval when we want to make uh, clinical significance out of the results. So you can say, although the point estimate was, uh, you know, 25% relative risk reduction, the effect could be as low as 9% or as high as 41%. So if you were to make a decision for your patient, you should consider like, is 9 a significant number? Or is 41 a significant number? Is the answer to both is yes, then the point estimate is clinically significant. Whereas if you, you know, if the answer is one of the ends of the confidence interval is no, so negative 38 is not a good number for your patient, they can say that this is not clinically significant because although 25 is a good number, the true effect could actually be negative 38. So it's important to consider the confidence interval when you want to make clinical sense out of the results. And now the actual external validity of the results. So the external validity is basically looking at the generalizability of the results. So how can I apply the results to, uh, to patient care or to my patient? So what you really want to do is to see how similar were the patients in the study to your patients. So this is where you examine the inclusion and exclusion criteria in the study. And also you look at the average patient in the in the in the study you look at the baseline characteristics so what was the average age what, you know what was the gender where did they come from what comorbidity did they have what other medications are they taking and um, you know it's not that it has to exactly match your patient but you really look for compelling indications uh, that you know to to look for things that would indicate that the results don't apply to your patient so if you cannot find compelling indications that the results do not apply to your patient, then you can say that uh, you know, this study is generalizable and apply to my patient. Next, you should evaluate to see if this study had uh, patient important outcomes. We already discussed the uh, surrogate endpoints versus um, clinical outcomes. So you should um, see and uh, to see if the outcomes are actually important to your patient. And that could depend on the actual disease that your patient has and um, things like comorbidities and uh, patient-specific factors. And of course, when it comes to composite endpoints, you should also evaluate which component of the composite endpoint um, actually applies to your patient and if it's significant. Now, as you have learned before, it's extremely important to calculate number needed to treat when you analyze the, the results of these studies. So in order to calculate number needed to treat, the results need to be statistically significant the endpoint needs to be clinical and it must be a superiority trial. So do not calculate number needed to treat for um, surrogate markers. Do not calculate it if the results are not statistically significant and do not calculate it in non-inferiority studies. Now, the calculation is relatively simple. It's basically 100 divided by absolute risk reduction as long as you're calculating absolute risk reduction in percentage. Here are some examples. Imagine we are looking at the percentage of patients who died in each group. So if 1% of patients died in the intervention group and 2% died in the control group, the relative uh, risk would be 0.5. So 1 divided by 2, 1% divided by 2% will give you 0.5. So relative risk reduction is 50% and the absolute risk reduction is 1. So 2% uh, minus 1% is 1%. So the number needed to treat would be 100 divided by 1, which is 100. Now, what if 20% of intervention group patients died and 40% in the control group died? You can see the relative risk is still 0.5 because, uh, you know, 20% divided by 40% is 0.5. So because it's 0.5, you still have 50% relative risk ratio. But the absolute risk reduction is a huge number now. So 40% minus 20% gives you 20%. So 100 divided by 20 is 5. So as you can see, it's much more useful to look at absolute risk reduction and number needed to treat when you analyze the results because relative risk ratio can be misleading. As you can see in these two examples, relative risk and relative risk uh, reduction, uh, they were the same numbers, but you can see that the, the the actual benefit is much larger in the second group. Now, let's also look at this one. So if 30% died in the intervention group and 40% in the control group, uh, 0.3 divided by 0.4 is 0.75. So 1 minus 0.75 is 0.25. So you had 25% relative risk reduction. The absolute risk reduction is uh, 40 minus 30%, so it's 10%, and 100 divided by 10% is 10. 
So number need to treat is 10. And that means that you would have to treat 10 patients uh, with whatever they received in the intervention group in order to avoid one death as compared to the patients who received the control treatment over the pre period of time of the study. Now, these are just hypothetical numbers just to show you um, how to calculate. And lastly, are the likely treatment benefits worth the potential harm and cost? And this is where we want to see if this, the results are clinically significant. So you can look at things like cost and you can also look at number needed to treat and number needed to harm to balance the risk versus benefit. Now, it's not to say that number needed to treat and number needed to harm are equivalent when you compare the numbers. So for example, if the number needed to treat is 50 and number needed to harm is 40, you know, you cannot just say that, well, the harm is uh, more than the benefit. So it, you know, you have to see, uh, you have to use these numbers in context. So for example, if number needed to treat of 50 is for mortality, and then number needed to harm of 40 is just for a headache, you know, it's okay if, you know, you're mosing, causing more more headache, um, you know, in favor of saving a, saving a life. So you got to use these numbers in context, and these are just tools to help you making a clinical decision. Of course, the values and preferences of uh, patients must also be considered and respected. So in summary, we looked at internal and external validity of studies. So in general, uh, let's say this uh, represents the population and your patient is among this population. And obviously we cannot study the entire population. So what we do is we actually take a sample of the population. So this is the sampling. This is where we have the inclusion and exclusion criteria to get a sample from the population and put it in our study and then the internal validity looks at um, you know the risk of bias in uh, when we measure the outcomes so you know for example there could be selection bias uh, and so forth and then uh, once the study is concluded you will have a conclusion um, but, you know when you compare the two groups and then once uh, you know assuming the study had good internal validity and the results are valid meaning that there was, you know, reduced risk of bias. So the conclusion, the results are close to the truth. Then the question is, so definitely uh, the results applies to the sample from the population because those were the people that studied. The question is, how generalizable is it? Does it apply to the rest of the population? And more importantly, does it apply to your patient? And that's where external validity comes in and you need to evaluate um, you know, things like inclusion, exclusion criteria and patient characteristic to see if that's close to your patient. And then also to, uh, to balance the risk versus uh, benefit, the cost, and also the patient values and preferences before you make a decision. This concludes this presentation.